المبارك في الأمسية الأولى من الـ Evidence Based Evening الأمسية هذه تعني بكل ما يهم الأطباء وممارسي الرعاية الأولية وكل من له علاقة في تقديم الخدمة في الصفوف الأولية في كافة التخصصات والقطاعات من ممارسين صحيين فسعيد جدا بضيوف المميزين الذين س تنطلق باذن الله على ايديهم الامسيه هذه الليله وسعيد اكثر بتو... العدد المسجلين لهذه الامسيه تجاوز ال 2500 والحضور الان ما شاء الله يعني في الدقيقه الاولى تجاوز ال 500 وال 30 فاهلا وسهلا بالجميع. اعطيكم بريف باك جراوند يعني المقدمه عن فكريه الامسيات لانه وصلت اسئله كثيره عن الامسيات وطبيعتها ايش الايفيدنس بيس ايفنينج ايش الامسيات قمه تطويق يعني مين الاف ام هاب مين السعودي سوسايتي وفاميلي اند كوميونيتي ميديسن فاخذ بس دقيقتين اقدم لكم يعني الانتروداكشن للانشطه هذه الجمعيه الطب والاسره والمجتمع طبعا هي من اعرق واقدم الجمعيات العلميه في في البلد هي الجمعيه الوحيده التي تعنى بالفاميلي ميديسن والبرايمري كير نشاط الجمعيه للاطباء للممارسين الصحيين للمرضى انفسهم للناس المهتمين في تطوير وتحسين الخدمه فهي لا تختص فقط باطباء الاسره بل تمتد لكل من يهتم بتقديم رعايه افضل للمرضى وللناس في الخطوط الاماميه الافم هبدت اورج هي الجمعيه غير ربحيه المجموعه من الشباب الناشطين والمتحمسين من قطاعات مختلفه الذين تطوعوا تحت هذه المظله ليصلوا معكم عن طريق الجمعيه وعن طريق اي جمعيات اخرى فالباب مفتوح ونرحب بالجميع للجمعيه او للاف ام الاف ام هاب دوت اورج الانشطه اللي نقوم فيها عديده وكثيره جدا يعني مثلا الاسبوع اللي راح كان في امسيات طويق امسيات طويق هي عباره عن امسيه العلميه لكنها تعنى بالشان العام في في البراكتس حق الميديسن والصحه العامه فهي ما هي مخصصه فقط في العلاج والتشخيص المرضي بل هي تشمل كل ما يخص الممارس الصحي او متلقي الخدمه طبعا احنا سميناها في الطويق تيمنا بال يعني بقائد المسيره في في التحول اسمه سيدي الامير محمد بن سلمان ستستمر هذه الامسيات الامسيه اللي راحت كانت عن تكلمنا فيها عن التدريب كل ما يخص التدريب في الفاميلي ميديسن الامسيه القادمه ويعني ماركو الكالندر يعني علموا الكالندر حتكون على نوفمبر 25 وحتكون للفاميلي ميديسن واي يعني ايش الفاميلي ميديسن ليش الفاميلي ميديسن ليش التحول كله قائم في الفاميلي ميديسن فما ميك شور يو دونت مس الامسيه القادمه وسندعو لها قاده من الفاميلي ميديسن من كل ارجاء مملكتنا الحبيبه الايفيدنس بيست ايفنينج اللي هذه اولها الانطلاقه المبروكه هذه الليله هي لمناقشه مواضيع طبيه مهمه بطابع ان بحيث ان نغلب عليه النقاش العلمي لتلمس حاجات الممارسين يعني الليله مثلا المحاضرين الكرام ما شاء الله عندهم يعني الولت اوف اكسبيرينس ونولج لكن طلبنا منهم ان يختصروا المحاضرات الى اقصى قدر ممكن بحيث نطلق المجال لاسئلتكم فبليز يعني الميك شور انكم ترسلوا لنا كثر ما يعني ما تحتاجون من الاسئله لان هذا الموضوع لهذا اليوم مميز جدا يعني احنا السكر منتشر كثير عندنا في المملكه 30% من الناس مصابه في السكر عندنا الطابع الاغلب للممارسين الصحيين الاطباء والتمريض والمثقفين انه يقفز على طول الى الادويه لكن الدواء ما هو الاساس في عمليه العلاج السكر في حاجات كثيره تبدا فيها المرحله العلاجيه للسكر فهذه الليله سنتطرق لها فيعني نتشرف بتلقي جميع اسئلتكم الامس الايفيدنس بيس القادم يعني بناء على الطلبات اللي وردتنا سنجعل عن موضوع طبي هام جدا وشائك اللي هو تطعيم الانفلونزا في معمعة كوفيد ما لها وما عليها هذا حيكون على ديسمبر 2 فماركو كالندر الجود نيوز اللي يعني الخبر الجيد ان الامسيه هذه في عليها 2 سي 100 كريديتد بالهيئه السعوديه 
ولتس اوبن فور فري لكل الريجسترنت لكن نشترط انه يكون فعلا اللي يسجل يكون معانا متواجد على الساحه الالكترونيه عشان يكون اليجبل هذا حسب قوانين الهيئه كل الامسيات القادمه سواء طويق او الافيدنس بيس ايفنينج سنحرص باذن الله انها تكون مجانا وسنحرص باذن الله انها تكون فيها ساعات الاكريديتد اورز طبعا هدف هذه الامسيتين يعني هي فقط يعني شيء من الانشطه اللي تقوم فيها الاف ام هب دوت اورج والجمعيه السعوديه للطب الاسره، لكن في انشطه كثيره يعني مثلا الاسبوع هذا في الويكند عندنا بروسيجر كورس للبرايمري كير فيزيشن يعني يعتبر هذا تقريبا نوعي وقليل جدا الوجود مثل الكورس هذا فالكورس هذا يعني انتهت الدوره هذه التسجيل فيه قفل لكن بعطيكم امثله عن الحاجات الموجوده. عندنا مثل المتدربين التدريب على الاورال اكزام يعني الكراش سوي هذا عندنا على نوفمبر 10 نوفمبر 16 18 عندنا انترناشونال ديابيتك فوت اللي فيه ناشونال اكسبرت وانترناشونال اكسبرت حيكون الفيرتشوال عندنا فيري سبيسيفيك ورك شوب للراديولوجي للبرايمري كير فيزيشن على نوفمبر 21 الى نوفمبر 22 عندنا فيري سبيسيفيك كوميونيكيشن سكيلز موجوده السكيجول فور ديسمبر 8 ومور ميني الايفنتس تو كم باذن الله تو فلفل ذا نيد حق البرايمري كير والفاميلي ميديسن وميت التوقعات في المرحله هذه من مرحله الترانسفورميشن طبعا احنا سعيدين جدا بالشريكنا في الشركه المنظمه ليف التروب يقوم بعمل رائع جدا في التنظيم والترتيب فسعداء جدا بوجودهم معنا ف يعني الشراكه الثلاثيه بين السعودي سوسايتي اوف فاميلي اند كوميونيتي ميديسن ليف ام هاب دوت اورج والايفنت تروب باذن الله خلال الثلاثي هذا سنصل الى جميع الممات ولطب الاسره والرعايه الاوليه في جميع انحاء مملكتنا المعموره باذن الله. ما اطول عليكم انا سعيد جدا هذه المساء أن يكون عن الميديكال نيوتريشن ثيرابي فور ديابيتس عندنا فيري سبيشل الجست السبيكر السبيكر الاول دكتور صالح ال ناس دكتور صالح از فرونت لاين فاميلي فيزيشن and he's a diabetologist and he's a trainer in the family medicine academy in the E1 cluster we are very honored to have Dr. Saleh with also we have Mr. Zaki Abu Makarim who is a senior clinical dietitian and diabetes educator in uh, Prince Sultan Military City in Riyadh we are very honored to have Mr. Zaki with us tonight through الـ 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 يعني الـ these two الـ الـ Guest, we're gonna go over the medical nutrition therapy for diabetes. We're gonna go start with the quick lectures, then we're gonna open the venue for question and answer. Dr. Saleh will start with you. Assalamu alaikum, sikum bil khair jamiyan. Thank you, Dr. Hadi, for the kind introduction, and it's my pleasure to be with you tonight. My talk mainly about medical nutrition therapy. And this is the outlines of my talk. We'll start with defining what we mean by MNT, Medical Nutritional Therapy. And then we'll talk about the effectiveness of uh, Medical Nutrition Therapy. And then we'll try to explore the connection between diabetes and carbohydrate. And then we'll have a quick overview about the evidence for low carb diet. Starting with definition, what do we mean by healthy eating? Uh, it's a pattern of eating combining both high quality and uh, high quality dense food in quantity that promote health wellness. What do we mean by MNT? It's evidence based application. So we are talking about evidence based. What do we mean by medical nutrition therapy? It's evidence based application of a nutrition therapy uh, process by registered dietitian. What do we mean by diabetes self-education uh, education support? It's encompassing the complex array of knowledge, skills, and the ability to, to, to enable our patient or our, our people with diabetes to, to, to maximize the effectiveness of the management of diabetes. So this is in brief about the definition. What are the goals of nutrition therapy? When we are providing MNT or medical nutrition therapy for people with diabetes, we should address individual nutrition needs. So not all the patients with diabetes are the same. There are varieties. So number one, individual needs. 
Number two, to promote and support healthful eating patterns, aiming to reducing the cardiovascular risk markers in people with diabetes, like A1C, blood pressure, lipid, and weight, aiming to delay or preventing the diabetes complication, and also to provide the individual with the practical tools to, for day-to-day -day mealing plan to enable them to plan for their meals. And lastly, we shouldn't forget that our ultimate goal for providing MNT is to maintain the pleasure of eating. Are MNT effective? What are the efficacy behind providing medical nutrition therapy? In terms of A1C reduction, MNT, it's not inferior. If it's not superior to many of the oral glucose medication agent, and the research supports that A1C reduce up to two percent in people with type two diabetes who got structured medical nutrition therapy. What about patients with type one? The reduction up to one point nine percent in the A1C in duration six, three to six months, and this is supported by multiple studies. So how to be implemented by registered dietitian and the encounter depends on the patient and his or her individual needs three to six months. Uh, moving to the second part of our talk, when we are talking about medical nutrition therapy, food in general, the macronutrients divided into carbohydrates, protein, and fat. And usually people with diabetes, if they know this fact, carbohydrates related or linked uh, directly to diabetes or blood sugar rise, they would ask why if I omit carbohydrate totally. So this question will try to answer it. What's the relationship and the connection between diabetes and carbohydrate intake? Whatever you take uh, from carbohydrate, whether it is a sweetie or even not non-sweetie, if it's carbohydrate, it will be converted eventually to glucose molecule and it will elevate the blood sugar uh, directly. And uh, carbohydrate divided based on the chemical molecules, either simple or uh, monosaccharide, disaccharide or polysaccharide. So this is the uh, classification, uh, simple, complex and fiber. Uh, we want to deliver one message from this slide. Some patients, when we are talking to them, simple, carbohydrate like fructose or glucose, fructose in fruits, uh, they will think this is simple and it will raise the sugar more higher than the complex. But this is not, not necessarily true. Complex carbohydrate like white bread, it tends to elevate blood sugar higher than, uh, for example, uh, some of the fruits. So this classification might be misleading, simple and complex. So the recommended classification carbohydrate classified into starch, sugar, and fiber. And these are the sources of carbohydrates, starch and their groups, grains, and cereal group, fruit, vegetables, and the milk groups. How people respond to uh, different carbohydrates, what we call the glycemic response. Actually, this depends on many factors, the amount and the quality of carbohydrates, the type and the amount, and the cooking process and the food form, liquid, solid, and the patient individual response. So uh, people, they tend to respond to certain foods differently. Some people, they will react to uh, orange, for example, different than other people. This depends on their severity of glucose intolerance, their preprandial glucose concentration. So all these factors should be uh, considered when we thinking about the glycemic response to food. This is an example. I'm talking about carbohydrate. We, we, sh we should talk about the bread, white bread or the whole grain or the bread. How they different? A stands for the white bread tends to elevate blood sugar more acutely and the rice is higher than the whole grain bread uh, stands for B. Why is this difference? Because the other components, both of them, this white bread and this slide, 
both of them they contains 15 grams of carbohydrates but why are they different because of the fiber components here the fiber approximately two gram while in the white bread is one gram so that's why the glycemic response is different between the white and the whole grain although the total amount of carb is 15 the same moving to the second most common food ingested in carbohydrate after bread is the rice What's the relation between rice and risk of type 2 diabetes and blood sugar in general? This is meta-analysis published in 2012 by BMG. And in conclusion, there's increased risk by 27% in risk of developing type 2 diabetes in patients having consuming large amount of white rice. Uh, this is another study published in uh, Diabetes Care Journal just this month. And again, relating the high intake of white rice relating to the incidence of diabetes. People consuming 450 gram cooked rice per day, their risk of developing or the incidence of diabetes increased by 20%. And this is statistically significant. Also, it's increased in South Asian population by 61% and again, statistical significant also increase in the rest of the world by 41% if they consume on daily basis 450 gram cooked rice per day. You might ask, what does it mean 450 gram? This is 450 gram. This is our usual intake per meal. If, uh, for this cooked rice, it's weighing 450 grams. You could imagine how many grams of carbohydrate in this plate. It's 152 grams of carbohydrate. This is in one meal. And if you would compare this small amount, it's only 10 grams of carbohydrate. If people are eating as usual in our country and in our culture, we are eating rice on a daily basis, white rice. This cooked rice weighing 450 grams having 152 gram of carbohydrate, it will increase the risk of developing diabetes by 41%, and this is statistical significant. So which sensible diet you want me to follow? This is a common question asked by our patients. So there are many dietary diets or many regimens. So there is trend about low carb diet and many patients, they, they perform low carb diet or keto diet by themselves. So without supervision. So what's the evidence for low carb diet? When you minimizing the carb intake, remember carb is the preferred fuel for the body and the brain is the uh, carb dependent organ. Okay, for carbohydrates. So when you eliminating carb from your dietary pattern, your body will uh, depends for producing energy uh, for metabolism in what's called ketone bodies and in a protein will be converted into amino acid and the liver will synthesize from this amino acid glucose and a process called gluconeogenesis. So patient, if they are eliminating carb, they will depend mainly in ketone bodies and in amino acid, and they will lose muscle, they will lose fat very rapidly. Is it recommended? What's the evidence behind this uh, dietary pattern? There are many controversy about it. And uh, remember that the preferred fuel for our body is the carbohydrate. Actually, if we go back historically, this before the widespread use of insulin, juicelin, uh, the diabetic diet was aiming to eliminate carbohydrate because at that time, insulin was not available widely at 1923. So they, in 1700 kilocalories per day dietary plan, they reduce carb intake for 15 grams per day and mainly to their, their, to, to be dependent on fat and protein. After the wide use of insulin, uh, the different uh, body of evidence, they are recommending 45 to 50% of total calorie to be uh, carbohydrate. What about the typical American diet? And we are not different from uh, American people. 
Typically, they consume up to 70% of their calorie intake from carbohydrate. If you go by classic keto diet, you are reducing this carb intake to 2% and you are increasing the calorie intake from fat. The modified one, it's the same minimal intake of carb from 5% to 10%. So how low is low? There are no consensus uh, on the defining very low or low carb. I get this summarized from different article. Uh, mainly the RDA recommendation, 130 per gram, the minimum intake of in carbohydrate. Uh, if you go below this, this is considered a, a low carbohydrate or very low. If you go to 20 to 50 gram per day, this is ketogenic diet and you are depending on ketone bodies instead of Carbo, uh, carbohydrate. This is an uh, interesting study published in 2019. They only minimize carbohydrate intake only in the breakfast from, uh, uh, instead of taking 82 gram of carbohydrate in the breakfast, they reduce it to five gram per, uh, per meal in the breakfast. See the response, the dotted, the dotted line, this is the, uh, the, the those who intake uh, five gram only of carbohydrate per breakfast. Their post breakfast blood sugar excursion is decreased. And not only this, the whole profile is decreased and the variability of glucose is decreased by only minimizing carbohydrate at breakfast. This is another meta-analysis showing that at uh, three months, the A1C uh, is decreased significantly in patients pursuing low carb diet, uh, but in Unfortunately, after 12 months, no difference between those who assigned to low carb or moderate to high carb. The efficacy, the effectiveness, and the uh, and reduction of A1C is lost after 12 months. And this is again another meta analysis showing compared to moderate and low carb, there is significant reduction in A1C at the three and six months. But at, again, at the 12 months, the efficacy is lost in patients assigned to low carb there is no statistical difference uh, in terms of A1C reduction. And this is again, in the long run, after two years, there is no difference in those with low carb diet or low fat diet in terms of A1C reduction from baseline. You might ask why in short term, there is clinical significant statistical reduction in A1C, but after 12 months to two, two years, this efficacy is lost might be uh, an explanation, uh, uh, one of the explanation, uh, low carb diet is difficult to follow for long uh, term. Uh, the sustainability and durability is not there uh, because it's hard to be dependent on, on, on only fat and protein and you eliminate carb uh, totally. Another explanation, you are dependent on protein and fat, and this will increase saturated fat and will increase the insulin resistance. So in the short term, it's okay, but in the long run, uh, the efficacy in A1C reduction is lost. This is another randomized, randomized control trial showing that low carb diet initially decreased the weight, but after 12 months, it's similar to conventional diet in terms of weight reduction. In terms of triglyceride, there is significant decrease in uh, triglyceride level if, uh, in those who assign to low carb diet. Another study uh, for 16 weeks, they decreased the carb intake from 200 per day to only 33 per day by week 16, and they are measuring the weight reduction from 131 to 122, almost 8 kg, and the A1C reduced, and the triglyceride reduced, and 30, third of the study population, they stopped totally their glucose lowering medication, and 50%, they reduced their glucose lowering medication. And this is another study showing those who assigned to low carb, they have less glucose level and less insulin, Level And what about study evaluating high carb intake? This is one of the famous study, nurse health study, evaluating the higher glycemic load was associated with higher risk of cardiovascular event. This is famous study around the prospective cohort studies called Bure study and published in the last set, uh, 2017. 
showing that uh, increased carb intake, more than 70% of total calorie intake per day, associated with significant increase, major cardiovascular disease, significant increase of total mortality. So in summary, benefit of low carb in people with type two, remember we are talking only about type two diabetic patient. The benefit of low carb diet, lowering A1C, lowering insulin, less medication, uh, weight loss, lowering blood pressure, improving lipids, and this cost. But remember, we are talking about reducing the refined uh, carbohydrate, the white rice, white bread, the sweets, the processed food. Please don't give this message to our patient that you should eliminate or reduce fruits, vegetable legumes because they are carb. We need it. They have minerals, vitamin, and they are nutritious. And the same study, your study, showing there is decreased cardiovascular mortality and morbidity with increasing legumes, vegetables, and fruits. What the ADA is stating, low-carb diet, you should emphasize on vegetable. You shouldn't eliminate totally the good quality of carbohydrates. So what you are aiming to say, ADA finally in 2019, they recognize uh, low carb diet as one of the viable approach, especially in patients with uh, not meeting their glycemic target and you are keep maximizing medication. Why you get step, uh, one step backward and think about their dietary habits because our culture, we are mainly dependent on carbohydrate. Unfortunately, the refined and the processed one, the white bread and white rice. And why if not, uh, we aim to uh, advise our patient to decrease these uh, refined uh, sources of carbohydrates. So how much carb intake per day? How is it spaced? Blacklisting one form of carbohydrate will not cure diabetes. Eliminating the carbohydrate totally will not cure diabetes. The message to eat the right uh, reasonable amount of carb in right amount and to be spaced throughout the day during the right time. And the message nutrition, diabetes education and intervention effective in improving outcomes as you've seen from the multiple studies we've shown. And also it's effective in delaying and preventing complication of diabetes. Patients with diabetes, they have high risk to develop other complications like diabetes, kidney disease. So diabetes is the, uh, the most risk factor for leading to diabetic kidney disease. And our primary care physicians, they are dealing with patients with diabetic kidney disease up to this level, up to GFR 30. We are responsible for them. So we need to uh, give a practical advice about those patients who have both diabetes and diabetic kidney disease. And this will be the main theme for the second talk. Uh, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Saleh. Very informative. Got lots of questions for you, but we're going to postpone the question till after the second lecture. Uh, we're very privileged to have uh, Mr. Zaki Abu Makarim with us, who's going to focus on a very important subset of the diabetic patient, those with nephropathy. We know diabetes is the main reason for kidney disease, and we need to, as, as a frontliners, we need to be equipped with uh, tools to advise our patient who have both the diabetes and the challenge of the kidney disease. Father, uh, Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for your introduction, Dr. Hadi. Um, my talk uh, today, uh, the language of my talk would be directed to the primary health care practitioner. It's not, I'm, I'm trying to, uh, as Dr. Hadi says, to simplify it because as a dietitian, we know a lot of, uh, there are not a lot of oils that has to be considered, but uh, as long that the patient uh, is uh, or the general practitioner is uh, facing uh, the dietary uh, issues with the patient because of the, the non-presence of the dietitian in the primary health care. Uh, so that's why all of the, of the effort is going to be directed to him or to her. Um, before we start, 
just let's just say, uh, you know, one of the patients says, when, you know, I just went on a very strict renal friendly diet. And there are only three things you can't put in your mouth. So what do you think is these three things that is, the patient cannot put it in your mouth? It's the knife, the fork, and the spoon. Of course, this is just giving like a joke, which is a tell, you know, like a kind that how much is the renal diet, especially, you know, diabetic renal diet is really strict. As a dietitian, experienced dietitian, I would tell you that uh, one of the most restricted diet ever is the diabetic renal diet at the end stages. Fortunately, that you are not going to face these patients who they are at uh, uh, in the stage um, or late stage of uh, kidney disease. Um, that's why I'm going to concentrate mostly on the first or early stages from one to three and may give some consideration for some uh, of the nutritional uh, aspects that needs to be taken in consideration. And just look to, if we look to the, how is the prevalence or let's just say uh, how many patient, diabetic patients who they reach uh, to the dialysis or in the stage renal disease, in the stage uh, um, in, as per the SCOT, so the Society for Kidney Transplantation or for Organ Transplantation, it shows that uh, in, 19, in 2016, that 35% of the patients are diabetic and hypertensive and 15% are diabetic, which is give us a total of 50 patients of the reach the hemodialysis are uh, with diabetes. Um, and the leading cause for that is the diabetic nephropathy, which is uh, take a value of 40%. So what is the goal that we need to look for when we talk to the patient about their diet? Indeed, um, the three consideration, main consideration is to reduce the renal workload. And that's to delay or prevent the further kidney damage. And that's what has been indeed uh, has been uh, proven by uh, evidence. And to restore or maintain optimal nutritional status. And if there is like high phosphorus or sometimes sodium and potassium, in addition to the urea that we can uh, see in some late cases, late stages, needs to control the accumulation of these toxins. And here we can see that what is the action is needed or the intervention needed intervention nutritionally that need to be considered in each stage. As you know that the uh, CKD or kidney uh, disease are classified to five stages. And the first stage is with GFR of 90 or more. And here, that's all what we need is to control the blood pressure and blood sugar level and the health and maintain healthy weight. But with the, uh, ad, uh, with the, uh, when, when the disease is advancing and uh, GFR is reduced to 60 or 89, which is in the stage two, then at that time, we might need to consider the uh, reduction or the protein intake to be moderate in moderate amount. In grade three, in addition to these two, we need to we might need to consider the decrease of uh, amount of phosphate. And we would talk about these uh, steps in each H1 separately. In stage four, that you don't see usually in uh, primary health care, uh, we need to monitor malnutrition and fluid status, and sometimes it's potassium. Of course, even in the earlier stages, which is three or two or one, we might find some people who they need to, uh, to, uh, to uh, restrict their fluid, fluid or their potassium uh, intake. Um, that's why also we need to look at that uh, when we talk about in the lecture. Uh, of course, the stage five is the in the stage uh, renal disease, which is out of our school. So let's just see in here, as we said, that control of blood pressure, blood sugar level, and healthy weight, and see how can we manage with that. Reduction of the sodium, that will help the control the blood pressure. 
So what about the amount of sodium? It's about two grams per day. Maybe these numbers means nothing to you, but when we make it in practice, and that's the, the, the um, aim of this talk, that to make it uh, as much as easy we, that we can to make it practical, so you can um, take this information to your clinic and you can use it with your patient. Patient often reported high salt diets in cooking and from the taking away. And if we look at this, this graph, we can see that the most amount of sodium is coming from the processed food in restaurants and foods, which is uh, taking about 71% of the total sodium that uh, people are taking. Um, of course, the reduction of the salt in the food is impalatable. That's we, why we need indeed, when we talk to the patient to consider this and to take it with him gradually if he cannot. It's just like, you know, some people who they are smoking and when you ask them to, to stop smoking, you cannot, not a lot of people, they can stop smoking from one trial and at the, from the first day. Uh, most of the patients will need to go gradually. It's the same with the low salt diet. Um, some, uh, many of the, or let's say most of the patients would need to go gradually with that. Uh, and changing of behavior, uh, usually uh, as per studies, shows that uh, it takes not less than three weeks to have any behavior that you need to change. Okay. Uh, for the salt substitutes, usually it's high in potassium. It can be used, um, but in case of hyperkalemia, at that time, we have to take care of that because it might raise the potassium for the more. So how we can, the step that we can use to limit the sodium? There are, let's just say, a few uh, easy um, steps that we can consider to cut out the, the package or the processed foods eating out, especially fast food. And when we buy, or the patient buy, buy the, the food, it's uh, very important to consider the fresh food more than the cooked meals and to look at the food label. And if there is uh, more than 0.3 grams, there are 100 grams of the uh, item in the food item in the food label, this is, would be high sodium amount. So it should be considered, should the, the, the consumer should consider the less than 0.3 grams, which is about 300 milligrams. Many food has sodium, or most of the processed food has sodium. So one of the way that to reduce the sodium intake is to rinse this amount, this food. For example, if the, for the tuna, for example, or, or olives, it can be soaked in a water, for some times, and this salt will be reduced with the time as much as it's soaked or rinsed, uh, uh, a lot of sodium or will, will be washed out. When cooking, and instead of using the salt, using of the spices and herbs, lemon, vinegars, more, all of the spices are, can be used, except of course, if, which is, can, uh, which is uh, containing of salt. If these steps has, is, is considered, the amount of sodium that is going to be taken depend on how much is the patient is going to follow these steps. It's about one to four grams of sodium per day. As you see in here for the food label, as you see uh, in the sodium, it's in here, uh, 1,310 milligram, which is 1.3 milligram of sodium. As you see, this is, a very high amount of sodium per one cup uh, of this food item. Uh, this is just uh, for your information. I wrote it, in, uh, it's written in Arabic. This is just to be, uh, if you would like to use it with your patient. The second thing that we need to consider is controlling of blood sugar level. And you know that uh, the aim for hemoglobin A1C is to be less than 7%. Why 
one of the important things with these patients is to consider that to have a regular carbohydrate serves. And one of the, in the other, some of the slides I will show you, or I will give you like an example for one day plan for the diet to make it easier. And also to give it to you like a home to take, to take it for you in your clinic and you can use it with your patient to make it more easier for you. Um, as Dr. Saleh mentioned in the first lecture to consider the low glycemic foods and of course to encourage the movement and exercise. All of that will um, share in controlling of blood sugar level. What about the, the maintaining of healthy weight? Maintaining of healthy weight is one of the important things that we need to consider with the type two patients when they are overweight. Um, reducing of the body weight if the patient is obese will improve the blood pressure and the cardiovascular risk and control the lipids and insulin resistance. And uh, many patients indeed, if they are or morbidly obese, they, they uh, get uh, their medication or their insulin dose is going to um, cut down and they, they might even uh, get rid of many of medication that they are taking because of the combination of diabetes. This is, as you see in here, I just wrote this one uh, today indeed to make it easier. I hope that, uh, it's, uh, that I don't miss anything in here because it was just prepared today. Uh, this is a program for 1600 kilocalorie for the patient who you think that they need to reduce their weight. So if you have a patient who the needs to reduce, to reduce their weight, you can use this as a program for them. Uh, as you see in here, this is the um, meat and their alternatives, and uh, bread and, and, and grains, and their products, fruits, vegetables, and there in here, the, and the um, fat. Uh, just to highlight one of them to understand how to use it. This is just one portion. As long as the, the slide is in Arabic, I'm going to explain it in Arabic. I hope that uh, all of the attendees are Arabic speakers. And if they are not, they are not going <laughs> by any means that to, to be able to use it. The number of أي واحد من المكتوب اللي قدامه في اللحوم بدائلها يعني مثلا لنفترض انه في يوم ممكن ياخذ حبه بيض في يوم اخر ممكن ياخذ 30 جرام تونه في يوم اللي بعده ممكن ياخذ نص كوب من العدس مع ملاحظه ان اللي هنا انه هذا هاي فول فوسفيت لذلك لما نحتاج اذا شخص منتبع له فوسفيت دايت زي ما راح نشوف فيما بعد يحتاج انه يتجنب هذه قدر الامكان نفس الحكاية لما نيجي على عدد الحصص في الغذاء حصة واحدة يكون 30 جرام مثلا دجاج عدد الحصص في العشاء ممكن تكون مثلا 30 جرام من اللحم أو ممكن تكون 30 جرام تونة وهكذا بالنسبة أمر آخر إلى نفترض بالنسبة للحبوب لو جينا على الغداء ثلاث حصص ثلاث حصص هنا تعني إيش إنه بإمكانه إنه يأخذ المكتوب هنا كله على حصة واحدة المكتوب كله هنا في الجدول من الجهة اليمنى كله على حصة واحدة هو ياخذ ثلاث حصص، ثلاث حصص اما تكون ثلاث حصص من نفس الايتم من نفس العنصر الغذائي او انه بامكانه انه ينوع يعني لنفترض لو اختار ياخذ الرغيف العربي حصتين هنا في الافطار حيكون بدل الربع خبز حياخذ نصف رغيف من الخبز. لو احب يشكل على سبيل المثال انه ياخذ ربع خبزه مع شريحه توست هذه اصبحت ايش؟ اصبحت حصتين وهكذا بالنسبه للجدول وبقيه الجدول. طيب في جريد 2 المرضى في هالحاله ممكن يحتاجوا موست اوف ذيم ويل نيد تو جو فور بروتين ليميتيشن ولما نقول ليميتيشن مش معناته انه يكون سوري اللغه العربيه خذتني وين وي سي ذات اتس لو ليميتد بروتين وي دونت مين ذات ذا امونت اوف بروتين شود بي ريستريكتد ذات ماتش اند انديد 
the recommendation is to go for 0.8 gram to, uh, and if we just compare it to the RDA, which the recommended daily allowances for the general population, it is 0.81 gram, 0.81 gram as the BRWHO. So it's about, about more or less about the same. We have to consider that there are two types of protein, the high biological value and the low biological value. The high biological value, which is, comes from the animal, like meat, chicken, fish, egg, dairy, and the low biological value, which is, comes from the uh, plants, like legumes, bread, grains, vegetables. And when I am just talking about these two, is just to consider that 50% or 75% is very, importantly to be coming from HB high biological value uh, when we are limiting the amount of protein. And one of the things that we have to consider before making um, reduction or limitation to the amount of protein the patient are they should take, that it has been found in studies that patients usually, when their GFR go less than 60 ml per minute, they have a self-restriction. Their amount of protein intake becomes less unintentionally, not by, because of the disease nature. In this slide, you can see it's the same as we explained in the, first, the previous slide, that um, most of the, of the patient is about 70 kg, if it's about, and we are going to give 0.8 grams, about 0.8 grams, it will be about 56 gram of protein. Most of the patient will go with this uh, diet. Diet, uh, Of course, it is not tailored as individual, and well, it's not individualized, but at least it is a start and a good start to uh, use it with your patient in the primary health care. Um, and here you can see that uh, the legumes has been deleted, and that's to give the chance to give more high biological value of protein. Patient with, the, about what about the phosphorus? Um, how many patients you are facing in the primary health care with who they have high barophosphatemia? Of course, most of the patients will be Stop by the first or the previous slide, and who they need only up to grade three, who they need only um, the, uh, the limitation of protein and uh, controlling of the blood sugar level, blood pressure, and maintaining of the healthy body weight. But some of the cases, you they run high phosphorus in uh, serum phosphorate. Despite that, usually it is doesn't go up until the GFR is 20 to 30 ml per minute. And you don't, of course, see these patients mostly. But some of the cases still, you can find them who they are on with high serum phosphate. Um, when, when we should restrict the phosphate? We should restrict the phosphate when it is more than 1.49 millimole per liter, which is about 4.6 milligram per deciliter. And it's usually in stage three or four. These are the food which is high in phosphate that we need to uh, address to our patient when we, are, when we are about to reduce the phosphate intake to control the serum phosphate. Um, legumes is one of the highest uh, food that is rich in phosphate. And so like black eye beans, المش أو الماش العدس بجميع أنواعه الفلافل الحمص الجلابة وهذه كلها these are bio, like a product of which is coming from the, uh, the other legumes the other the second one which is higher in high in phosphate is the nuts despite that the nuts especially if it is low in salt is good but when it comes to the phosphate, indeed, it is high in phosphate, so it needs to be uh, limited or avoided when the patient run high phosphate, serum phosphate. 
Um, and this is peanut butter. And this is the uh, bulldog, as we call it, and the animals that are used to feed on phosphate. The sec third one online is the dairy products, which is high on phosphate. Um, these are choose you either lemon, yogurt, milk, anything which is made of these. Like in here, jerish is made of mostly contain a lot of lemon. Uh, these juices. So this one needs also to be uh, considered for that. Uh, that's why we limit the amount of milk or their products. As you see in the first one, I would show you in here to one to one portion. And the one portion in here, by the way, is different than one the one which is for the diabetic one. This is like which is for the diabetic renal patient. So it's only a half cup per day, and that's for the aim of the controlling of the phosphate. A part of the food which is high on phosphate also is the whole grains. Whole grains is one of the good food uh, that we have to consider in our food and patients' food and diabetic patients' food. But when it comes to the phosphate, then it will be the opposite. Indeed, we have to advise the patient to go with the white grain, with, or let's say to avoid the whole grain or to reduce it as much as possible. Uh, a kind of uh, examples for the holy grain, of course, the bread, all of the breads, and this is al-haris, al-aruz al-bunni, al-dukhun, or the ashiyah al-masnu'ah min al-dukhun, that is موجودة في مناطق الجنوبية, المرقوق في المناطق الوسطى, and then al-haris. في أكثر كثير من المناطق من ضمنها طبعاً المنطقة الشرقية. Unfortunately, most of the, the food label when uh, the, base, uh, the consumer need uh, about to uh, let's say the consumer about to buy their food there is nothing indicating uh, the amount of the milligram of the phosphate but we can look at the amount which is uh, written as percentage of the daily phosphorus needs if it is less than five this is the phosphorus when it is less than five percent which is about which is about less than 50 milligrams per day by that uh, time, then this is, can be taken. Uh, and of course, if it is five to 15, that's medium. If it's more than 15, that would be means that the food, this food item that we are about to buy or the patient are about to buy is means that it's high in phosphate. What about the fluids? The fluids depends on the stage of the CKD, um, blood pressure and edema. If the patient is receiving diuretics, it's maybe it's needed to reduce the fluid intake for less than two liters per day. And if the fluid is restricted, then sodium needs to be restricted because they go together. It means fluids need the sodium restriction, but not the vice versa. Some of the patients run also high serum potassium. And most of the reason, a lot of reasons, or let's just say a number of the reasons that uh, raise the, the potassium, the serum, is the drugs. And mostly it is the R, the uh, um, receptor blockers, the ARB and the ACE. Uh, these uh, medications might, uh, at certain dose, might, serve, uh, might raise the potassium. Um, when the potassium, serum potassium, goes by in the 5.5, milligram per deciliter that the time that we need to consider a low potassium diet. And indeed, uh, but a low potassium diet is uh, really uh, considered as a kind of diet when it is goes with the diet for the renal diet, make a lot of restriction. Hopefully that you can, you don't uh, face a lot of patients with this uh, problem or who they need with hyperkalemia. Uh, Sorry for these lecture pictures that comes in here, but it's it's just uh, this is an Arabic that you can use, especially as still in your clinic. This is show you uh, that the, uh, what kind of food that is high in phosphate, potassium, sorry, and needs to be avoided. And in here, what amount, what is the uh, replacement that can be uh, taken? This is another one. It's just to go for like an example. 
for that it's just for vegetables like the fried potato potato المقلية أو المحمرة طماطم شمندر مشروم الذرة الحلوة الأفوكادو طبعا the story is not about the how the type of the food that he is taking as much as it is about how much the big the consumer the patient is taking uh, these vegetables are the, among the big the vegetables which is low in potassium considered only what it is compared with this one and still one of the good idea is how to get less potassium from these is to get it in a small pieces and to boil it for 20 minutes in a large amount of water which just like one to five one of cup like one uh, cup of uh, vegetables cut off cut uh, as much as you uh, cut it smaller as much that the water can take more uh, potassium from these vegetables uh, this is uh, of course uh, for the old food labeling it is not mentioned but still if it is not mentioned we can see that it, it is uh, among the written as among the percentage of the daily intake which is when it is less than three percent of the about 100 gram, milligram. For the calcium, one of the things that when the, the diet, for the renal diet, renal diet is providing only about 500 to 800 milligram, while the uh, needed is about 1200 to 1500 milligram based on the uh, uh, daily recommended uh, uh, intake, sorry. So this is what would be the last uh, slide. So uh, the problem that the diet, that renal diet cannot provide the required amount because whenever the food is that you can find the calcium and you will find the phosphate. So the patient is on low phosphate diet, unfortunately will not get enough calcium from the food. So these patients might need, it's a good, uh, maybe it's a good idea to give them uh, supplementation, uh, by, uh, I mean calcium supplementation. Um, of course, this is uh, just like um, to tell us that uh, variety of the food, and it's not just only to limit everything to the patient and uh, to ask them to take the same kind of food every day. Thank you, Afia. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Zaki. Uh, and um, I'm going to ask both uh, my distinguished speakers to be uh, on the stage, Dr. Saleh and Mr. Zaki. We're going to take a few questions. Just a comment, Dr. about the food that we have to eat. We're in Saudi Arabia. Let's take the rice and the rice and the rice. We don't have anything else. You didn't have rice or the rice. How to satisfy <laughs> people? I have many questions on this topic. طيب, let's start. <laughs> Dr. Saleh, you mentioned a very interesting point. Medical nutrition therapy can decrease the A1C by 2%, which is almost as potent as some of the oral medication. This is for type 2 or type 1 as well. What about type 1? What about medical nutrition for type 1 diabetes? Yes, uh, excellent question. Actually, this is both. For type 2, up to 2%, depending on the, some of the studies. And also for type 1, MNT reduced the A1C up to 1.9 in a duration of 3 to 6 months. So there's uh, evidence pointing to both type 1 and type 2, the medical nutrition therapy reducing A1C. Is there any specific... Uh, precaution uh, for type 1 diabetes when it comes to med medical nutrition therapy? Uh, actually, for type 1 uh, medical nutrition therapy, we are going with uh, carbohydrate counting, and this is the most effective tool to manage uh, diabetes in patients with type 1 diabetes. So because they found the total amount of carbohydrate, it's the main responsible for blood sugar or for blood glucose rising. So aiming or focusing on the total amount is, has a direct effect on blood sugar control in patients with type 1. So the carbohydrate counting or depending on the total amount, quantifying the total amount of carbohydrate intake. For talking about the minimum amount for adult with diabetes, 
130 gram per day, we are talking about 45 gram uh, per meal. Uh, the main problem with our patient, uh, diabetes, they don't have predictable pattern of eating. They, uh, they minimize or they skip some of the meals or they eat very little carb in such meal or in X meal and they inject insulin, they get hypos, then they over eat and subsequent meal, they indulge a large amount of carb. If we are talking about 200, 200 gram per day, this is moderate to high amount of carb per day. We have seen some patients, they are eating on one meal, uh, 200 gram reaching to 300 gram carbohydrate. So the total amount of carbohydrate is the main direct factor relating to the uh, blood sugar fluctuation and the blood sugar effect and the blood sugar control. So for type one, mainly the looking for the total amount. Not uh, We also consider the quality, but the quality and type of carbohydrate to fine tune the blood sugar level. So whatever type of carbohydrate you eat, at the end, the amount is the main responsible for blood sugar rise. Thank you very much, Mr. Zaki. I got a question from our audience. You go, let's be practical. Yani, a major, we have lots of people with diabetes, and majority of what they eat is, is, is what you want them to stop, is the rice and the bread. So how to give a practical advice to those people? And listen, I'm not nephropathy, we're just diabetes. Uh, it's never been asked to stop the bread or the rice. It's indeed one of the major food items that the patient needs to take. Uh, and if we just consider the, the, the table that I show for the 1500 kilocalorie or for the 2000 kilocalorie 56 grams, you will find that most of the food comes from indeed from the, from the bread and grains and from the fruit. So, as long that you are going to limit the amount of protein and the patient at the same time needs would needs more calories, this amount of calories will be replaced, of course, by the, the other uh, provider, the macro uh, nutrients provider, which is the carbohydrates and the uh, fat. So fat and carbohydrates, or let's just say the rice and bread is one of the main a food items that the patient who they are following a renal diet or diabetic diet, indeed, they have to uh, take. Excellent. Okay, uh, Dr. Saleh, keto diet for diabetics? Yes, no, and if yes, for how long? Uh, my answer always we go individualized. So there are variety and different needs for, from patient to patient. The pre-printed prescription for diet and fitting all is not recommended. So no size fits all. Uh, the ADA, lastly, in 2019, uh, they, they, they recognize low-carb diet and very low-carb diet as a viable approach for patients not meeting their glycemic uh, targets talking about people with type 2 diabetes. So this is, should be individualized and this is different from patient to patient. And if they decide their care provider, they decide to go with low carb should be under supervision of, of healthcare provider and registered dietitian. It's uh, addressed in the ADA, one of the viable approach for people with type 2, not meeting their glycemic targets. Excellent. Uh, Mr. Zaki. Our audience are very creative. Let me give you the question. They, they are suggesting something called nutrition sequencing, like eating protein and vegetable before carbs. And the stuff is not the only first suggestion. The second suggestion, they want to complement that with an exercise, post meal exercise. It might be effective in insulin, improving insulin sensitivity. What do you recommend? On the sequencing, start with, they start with the protein and fat. So you say they, they they call it the sequencing. So they start with the protein, vegetables before the carb. Then they introduce the carb. Will that and make it better for the blood glucose? 
What would be the idea behind that? Uh, they suggested it might help the glucose profile. Now, what about if they are, if they like later on, they take the carbohydrates? It will raise the blood sugar fastly and quickly. Let's just say, you know, this is when you take the amount of the food. This, uh, in the first lecture, it has been mentioned about the glycemic index, okay? The glycemic index, one of the things that is affecting the glycemic index is the mixing of food. So if the food is taken as carbohydrates only, it is, will be different than when it's taken with the other like protein and fat together. So the glycemic index will be less. So the, how quick is the blood sugar will go to the blood, to the blood is depend on the, what is the glycemic index of the meal, not the glycemic index of the food item. So by this mean, if they get, take this sequence of food, you know, by, uh, it's going to affect the glycemic index. Yes, if we are going to talk about another issue, like for example, patient is diabetic, and at the same time as a renal patient, he's a CKD patient, uh, and this patient is not taking the medica uh, taking any medication, or let's just say only like metformin or uh, a, non a medication that doesn't uh, cause hypoglycemia, let's say, you know? Then if the patient wants to do that for, and he is comfortable, she is com or she is comfortable with that, there is no problem with that. But what, uh, for, for the control of blood sugar, it's not going to do what is you are aiming for. So you allow me, Dr. Hadi. Yes, please. Uh, with your permission, Abu Muhammad, uh, if you allow to add to this point. Zima uh, Tawar, uh, Abu Muhammad, different, or uh, if you are referring to glycemic index food and you are talking about the rate of blood sugar rise after eating specific food. Okay, this is experimental because we never eat the items separately. The meals containing different items and different glycemic index. So at the end, uh, individual glycemic index of one item, it will be different if you mix it with other components of the meal. And uh, for the sequencing, uh, some studies, and th by the way, this is the Chinese way of eating. They eat the protein, they eat the fish or the meat, then they eat the rice. And uh, there is a study in, in Asian population, Chinese, uh, they give the burger, they, one group, they eat the meat, then the, uh, the, uh, the tomato, the, the meat, then they ate the bread. And another group, they eat uh, the whole, the burger, the whole, as usual. Those who started with the protein, the rise of blood sugar is blunted, delayed, because they started with the protein. And this is the traditional way uh, of Chinese eating. So, uh, Dr. Hadi, can our patient eat uh, if I may also to say something, because I, maybe as just to make it clear to even to myself, if it means that uh, sequencing in the same meal, starting of one item before the other item in the same meal without delaying the other item for later on, I would say there is no problem. This is something related to the, let's just say, uh, patient uh, desire. You know, and one of the most important thing is how is the desire, uh, the patient desires that like what they like to do. If they like to do that, it, there will be no effect. But at the end, at the end, it will be more or less the same. Okay, uh, Abu Muhammad. So this question from uh, someone with type one diabetes, and they want to build muscle, and they are worried about their kidney. What is your recommendation? What they should well, do? Well, as long as long, uh, studies didn't show if the amount of the protein is more up to 35%, up to 35% of the total calorie intake of a protein has been proven as a safe. If it is more than 35% of uh, total calories, 
the consequences is not clear indeed. It hasn't been shown what is the consequences would be. But let's just say as a prevention for patients who they need to raise their, or just to build a muscle, there is like a wrong uh, idea about the amount of protein that the, these people need. Indeed, the amount that is taken is not that much as they do. The amount of protein is uh, that they are taking, you know, even if we are like, uh, you know, in the, um, the patients who they are, they having burns, about 70% of the burns, you know, in, this, in the, uh, the hospital. And they, these patients, they have the, one of the most, uh, the, the highest amount of protein uh, uh, people who they need it. They need the, these people, they need the highest amount of protein. Even in that patients, they don't need more than 3.5 grams per kilogram of body weight. While the others are taking about 10 grams maybe of per kilogram, which is too much indeed. So back again, these patients, the, the people who they are in stage one, uh, sorry, type one diabetes, and they like to build the muscle, they can be, build the muscle with raising the amount of protein to up to even 35% of the total calorie requirements, the, and they will be okay, they will be safe. Unless, um, unless if they are already a CKD patient. That's, if they are, if they haven't developed any CK, uh, chronic disease, uh, kidney disease. Dr. Saleh, before recommending any specific diet, is there any specific lab investigation that you will do or go by body weight, deciding the type of the diet, or just general recommendation would fit all for a loss, as long as they don't have CKD, just like Abu Muhammad said? People with diabetes, we go by history and uh, we got their diet diary. Uh, we try to analyze, for example, three days of diet diary. We analyze their food. We calculate their calorie intake, their carb intake. And uh, for the labs, the routine labs for people with diabetes. Uh, his A1C is high, his uh, blood sugar high or fasting or post bronchial is, is high. So I will address that and I will relate it to, 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 to blood sh sugar levels more uh, beneficial than the routine lab if patient on what's called CGM, continuous glucose monitoring. This will help us a lot to identify what's called the individual response to food. Because we said in the lecture, every different uh, patient has his or her own individual response to specific item and to specific meals. Uh, not all the patient will respond to the food similarly. So I will try to teach my patient to get their own uh, uh, glycemic index or their own individual response to food, okay, to, 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 uh, before starting, and it will help us to fine tune and uh, to adjust the diet for those people. So if, for example, this patient, after lunch, he's having post prandial hyperglycemia by the continuous glucose monitoring. And I'm seeing that this is a pattern, repeated hyperglycemia after lunch. I will analyze his lunch food, okay? What the items raising this blood sugar, and I will try to modify his, his meal. So to answer routine labs as for a patient with people with diabetes, uh, the routine labs and the continuous glucose monitoring, for example, the Libri or other uh, devices of continuous glucose monitoring, he's already on this CGM. It will help us a lot. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Zeki, the, our audience is asking, because we, we spoke a lot about grams. Can we give them something touchable like spoon, uh, cup, something yes. they relate to, to make it easy yeah. for them. Yes, that's right. Uh, indeed, uh, I was in a hurry to, uh, to prepare that, uh, that slide. So I couldn't write everything in there, but this is really a practical and nice, uh, nice highlights. Uh, well, 30 grams is about like, let's just say about, let's say this way, let's say, okay. It's about two fingers. Uh, and if we, we can use uh, 
فور ذا اور اتس جست اباوت ذا اللي هي علبه الكبريت يعني حجم علبه الكبريت از اباوت 30 جرام وان اذر وان از جست لايك اباوت ذا ثم ثم از اباوت 30 جرام بس يوزنج اوف فينجرز براكتيكالي فروم ماي سايد يو نو ذا اماونت ذا فينجر سايز از از يوزد Uh, in the clinics, but I can find it that it's different from one to another. I can find that my finger sometimes is for a lady finger or someone who is a big one finger is, one is not going to be like a 30 grams. <laughs> it might, might be like a 90 grams for one guy thumb, you know? So uh, like, um, it's just like if we use uh, the, uh, the, the, like the Albat uh, al-Kabrit, can be اكثر قربا 30 جرامز 90 جرامز let's just say three portions of meat three portion of meat uh, it's usually they use uh, هي ورق الكوتشينه كمثال الى انه الشده حقت الكوتشينه تكون هذه three uh, ounces of meat for carbs for carbs it's mentioned in the slide that it's by carbs and most of the food uh, all of the food that is when it is mentioned It's mentioned after cooking. So for the rice, when we talk about the rice, we talk about one third cup of rice is a one portion, is one portion. Macaroni or pasta, one half cup. So if, the, if someone is uh, advised to take four portions, for example, of rice or three, let's just say three portion of rice in the dinner time or lunch time, that would be about a cup of cooked rice. So it's there, yes. Um, I hope when you go back to the slides that uh, if, if you take it as, if you take a, like a screenshot, you will find that it is written in carbs, except the 30 grams. And even for the, for the fruits, it has been mentioned as the sizes and even in beside it is the weight, how much is the weight for some people. And one thing, by the way, when we teach our patient, maybe when I say this, it is, could be, could be like, uh, a little bit taking time from the practitioner in primary health care. But they just say what we do usually as a dietitian with our patients. When we teach our patient, even with the grams, you know, especially when they are on carb counts, for example, even with the grams, they use the grams for the first few days. And then after this, By their eyes, they can't even measure how much is in their plate. So they get used to it and to the amounts, and they know how much is in each plate of each food. Okay, thank you very much. I was smiling, Abu, Abu Muhammad, when I said يعني, one third of a cup of rice. يعني, a question would come from the patient, before meal or after meal, one third of the cup. بهنا قلنا احنا it's not one third cup one third cup is one portion right. one portion it is not the whole it is not what he needs or she needs to take in the one in, in one meal so if we go back to the slides that I give uh, like 2000 kilo carry with 57 grams of or 56 grams of protein you will find if I uh, it's about four portion of rice, oh, sorry, of the grains. Four portion of rice, of, of uh, grains in the lunch or in the dinner, it's about one, one cup plus one third. From the bread, it is uh, four portion, it's one, one whole bread in one meal. So if we, it's one whole meal, you know? So it's not the, um, the abortion, the amount of portion that's mentioned there, it's per one portion. It is not the whole that he needs or she needs to take in the meal. That's what it depends so on. He needs or the patient needs to know how much is the portion and how many portion he needs or she needs to take in each meal. Excellent. Dr. Saleh, one question about the low carb diet and the coronary artery calcium progression. Is it a concern about the low carb diet impacting the heart? Yes, for coronary artery calcium score, uh, it's a, a marker to identify how this patient at risk to have a coronary event. 
Okay, mm -hmm. and they are uh, many uh, articles. They are calling to add this uh, uh, marker, coronary artery calcium scores, to predicting the cardiovascular risk for patient. Uh, besides the tools, the, the AHA tool or the Framingham or other tools. Uh, so this is about the coronary artery calcium scoring. It's basically predicting the risk of cardiovascular events. Uh, and study called Cardia study, which is a, 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 a evaluating uh, a, a people, uh, young people, uh, uh, by measuring their coronary artery calcium score to predict their risk of having cardiovascular events. They found that those who assigned to low carb diet, they have higher score of coronary artery calcium score. They have higher score. Mm -hmm. Okay, because they basically, when you lower carb intake, you are increasing the fat and protein intake, and there are a lot of saturated fat. So the calcium uh, artery scoring is increasing. But remember, this is surrogate marker. It doesn't mean that the cardiovascular events are increasing. All what they said, the coronary artery calcium score is increasing. So this is surrogate marker. I show in the lecture, pure study, which is prospective cohort study, what they found, the carb intake increasing, the cardiovascular events increase, the mortality and cardiovascular increase. So uh, different studies, uh, there's no consensus about low carb diet, very low carb diet, especially on the long run. If we are talking about cardio study, this is uh, more than 15 years. All of the study I mentioned here, maximum years, two years or seven years. So there is mixed evidence about low carb and very low carb diet. And all the question about low carb, it's asked by to, to me. I'm not calling to be to make it clear. I'm not calling. I'm not advocate for low carb or keto diet. I'm showing the different studies and the ADA guidelines stated clearly uh, low carb diet, very low carb, viable approach. It can be addressed for selected patient under supervision of healthcare provider. Okay, so and uh, the study I showed that fruit, uh, vegetable, legumes, all are carbohydrates and they are associated with decreased cardiovascular mortality and morbidity. And we are encouraging people to eat. Our problem with the processed food, desserts, sweets, and white bread and white rice. This is our problem with the refined carbohydrate because lack the lacking fiber, less nutritive, and the, the, the risk is associated higher with this type of food, refined carbohydrate. Excellent, Mr. Zeki. Let's talk about some herbal approach to to diabetes. In our audience are asking about the halba and about the cinnamon. Does it work? Make it better? Make it worse? Yeah, there, yeah, there are some studies that has shown that it is that uh, halba uh, and cinnamon uh, has uh, effect uh, high to reduce the blood sugar. Uh, but it, in a certain amount, I cannot recall the, the grams now uh, of uh, how much uh, the should be taken. But uh, to be taken, it needs to be considered that uh, it, it might uh, get the, 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 the people who they are using it might get hypoglycemia. So they have to consider the physician as a practitioner, they, if they are going to, uh, they have in seeing patients who they are using it, they need to consider that risk of hypoglycemia is there. Okay. Uh, Dr. Saleh, there's so many questions about the sweeteners that they in coffee, with tea, fruit sugar, or whatever other sweeteners that are non the regular sugar. Is it good? Is it bad? Do we know? Uh, it's called the artificial, artificial sweetener or non-nutritive sweetener, or low-calorie sweetener, like uh, Sortiva, Stiviana, and others, Spartan. Uh, it has been addressed in the ADA, and it's approved by FDA, as long as uh, it's within the recommended daily intake, 
باش ول نيفر اكسيد ذا ريكومندد ديلي انتيك اتس اوكي ديبندس اون ذا بيشنت اف ذي وونت تو تيست ذا تي without sugar or with uh, with this artificial sweetener they are 100 times more sweetener than uh, sugar but they uh, have very low calories uh, abu muhammad عنده خبره بهالمجال ممكن ابو محمد sweeteners are two types artificial and natural artificial dr saleh has already mentioned them Um, and the other one is the natural one, which is the sugar alcohol, which is like, um, um, what is it called? It's usually used, used in, in, if you go to the corner, uh, diet corner in each supermarket, you find some kind of zero tool, zytool, lactitool, I get it. Okay, um, if you go there, you will find some, for example, halawa tahiniya or jam or uh, some peanut butters that they are using these type of uh, sweeteners, which is natural one. And this is, this one is not bad. It's okay, but at, if it's taken in a, a, a more than 25 grams per day, it might cause diarrhea for some patients in addition to uh, abdominal distension. So uh, it is safe as long as it is not that much they are taking. Excellent. Dr. Saleh, diet therapy, how soon it will show results to the diabetic patient? Like for example, for typical medication, we will take the medication, let's see you in three months. What about that? When we expect to see outcome? Okay, we show that by evidence and by study. Some of the studies, uh, short duration study. So if, uh, one of the study I uh, mentioned in the lecture, in week 16, they, their A1Cs decrease uh, by 0.5%. Their weight decreased by 8 kg in 16 weeks only. Their weight decreased, their triglyceride decreased, their uric acid levels decreased. So by, you are expecting even by for 16 weeks, you are expecting the results. Uh, in short term, low carb, very low carbs is very significant, three to six months. But after 12 months, they lose their efficacy because two things, durability, sustainability, and adherence. Difficult to be for people to adhere to very low carb diet. And uh, the, the, you are dependent on protein and fat, higher saturated fat, increasing insulin resistance. So in the long run, uh, more insulin resistance and the efficacy of A1C reduction is lost after uh, the 12 months. Excellent. Mr. Zaki, we spoke about the abortion and the, about the meals. Now, is the time frame between the meals has been too equally distributed? to get the benefit of the diet system or it doesn't really matter? Okay, um, that would depend on type of medication that patient is taking. If patient on like, for example, a mix of NBH with, with, uh, with regular or rapid acting insulin, then there should be a matching between the time, the, the injection and, and the meals. So, uh, if missed, patient might get hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia. If the patient is not on any, uh, is not on this medication, uh, so like for example, patients who they are rapid acting insulin, they have more freedom in taking of the meals. So they can uh, take the meals, you know, there is no such specific amount between the meals that the uh, patient needs to follow. Okay. Dr. Saleh, we spoke about the, uh, the uh, calcium scoring and the low-carb diet. Now, what about the ketogenic diet? Does it increase mortality? Is there any evidence to say that? Any study? I'm not aware about specific studies, but most of the studies evaluating low-carb, very low-carb, they are short-term studies. And they are evaluating surrogate markers 
ايفالويتنج اي 1 سي ايفالويتنج البلود بريشر ايفالويتنج ترايجس رايد ايفالويتنج ذا ويت ذيس ديزيز اورينتد ماتر سوريجيت ماركرز your study showing that increasing carb intake above 70% of total calorie associated with increased cardiovascular mortality and morbidity. So the pure study, which is the prospective cohort study published in the Lancet 2017. Okay. Uh, Mr. Zaki, we spoke about the diabetics. What about those with pre-diabetes? Would your advice be any different from for those with diabetes? Nice question. Indeed, uh, of course, what I addressed is the, the diabetic uh, kidney disease, but for prevention of for the pre-diabetes or for the prevention of diabetes, even without pre-diabetes, healthy diet is the one that needs to be considered. Healthy diet is the same, let's just say, take it this way. What is the diabetic diet? The diabetic diet is the, di the healthy diet. It is named uh, after the diabetes, but it's not only for diabetic people. It is for all of the population. Diabetic diet, it's, which is low in sugar. What is it, the, the uh, aspects of this one? It is low in sugar, low in fat, uh, the, the saturated fat and cholesterol. Low, uh, moderately low on salt, high in fiber. Um, so this is the diet that is should go with all of the population indeed. And except of course, the people who they need a special diet, like for, as we mentioned for the CKD, for example, uh, or other, some other diseases. So for pre-diabetes or for prevention of diabetes, it is the same. Patient needs to reduce the weight, exercising, and following the healthy diet. And when I say reducing the weight, of course, for the people who they are more, uh, I mean, overweight or obese, obese. So these, the three uh, points that needs to be considered when to prevent diabetes or to treat the pre-diabetes. Excellent. I guess, Should allow me just to uh, uh, for, for patient with pre-diabetes, actually, lifestyle exercise, in addition to medical nutrition therapy, is more effective than medication, more effective even than metformin. And this is famous study called DBB trial, Diabetes Prevention Program. Uh, Nutrition therapy with exercise reduce uh, incidence of diabetes who have pre-diabetes by 58%, metformin only by 30, 31, almost 31%. So medical nutrition therapy is strong weapon and usually it's underutilized. Okay, so uh, along the theme of the medical nutrition therapy, we spoke a lot about adults. How about pediatrics? Any specific precaution? Will you do the same approach, Dr. Saleh? Will you use the same concept of car counting for children? Yes, this is an excellent question. Actually, for pediatric, most of pediatrics we are talking, pediatric with diabetes, we are talking type 1 diabetes. Although we are seeing nowadays pediatric with type two diabetes. But most of the children, they have type one diabetes and the most effective way is carb counting. So we recommend carb counting for pediatric, especially because they have, they don't have predictable pattern of eating. Their eating is erratic because they are kids. And to give them flexibility, we teach them and we teach their caregiver to count their carbohydrate. Uh, we don't recommend fixed amount of insulin for pediatric because simply uh, you will never predict their meal better. Some days they will eat as much as they can. Some days they will omit the meals. Some, some days they will eat at the beginning, then they will run. So we, we teach the caregiver to 
do cow cow thing for pediatric special. It's recommended. Any addition, uh, Mr. Zaki, on the pediatric age group? Uh, indeed, uh, carb, carb counting can be used for most of the patients, either for diabetes, for the type 1 or type 2. Um, and as Dr. Saleh mentioned, yes, uh, patients who they are, di who they are uh, at young age, they uh, practically go with the diabetic for the carb counts more easily than with the fixed, or let's just say, which is called food exchange system. So uh, yes, carb counts is the more the, the the one which is or the best choice for the pediatric patients. Of course, okay. with some consideration, like uh, either the, the the pediatrics they have to uh, any patients who should follow a diabetic diet. There are some. Uh, principle, or let's just say, some things needs to be considered uh, before giving them this uh, carb count. That they have a math skills, you know, or at least they have a caregiver who have a math skills. They have, uh, they are, uh, or he or she is uh, uh, have a good compliance to for taking off uh, uh, blood sugar on time and recording of the amount of carbohydrates that he or she is taking. So all of these uh, should be considered before we go with the low carb for these patients, so either for pediatrics or non pediatric patients. Excellent. So uh, to you, uh, Mr. Zaki, as well, you got a patient who's diabetic, when the CKD, or actually he's on dialysis, and he's like restricting his, his diet because of the sugar. He's, just, he's not eating meat because of the protein and salt. And they are telling him the whole grain is, has lots of phosphorus, be careful. What's your advice for that patient? Patient in dialysis? Yes. Oh, if patient in dialysis, that's a different story. Okay. Because patients when they are in dialysis, they need more protein indeed, not less protein. If we, if we remember that we only mentioned a bunch of the protein in one of the slides that the patient in the, stake, in the earlier stages, they need about 0.6 to 0.8, depending on the stage, like in, uh, which is from uh, stage two to stage four, okay? And um, while it's 0.6 to 0.8, why if we compare it to the patients who they are in hemodialysis, they would go for 1.2 gram per kg. And if they are in hemodialysis, even up to 1.3 grams of, of uh, protein per kg. So uh, amount of protein is not restricted indeed as it is in there. I would then call it even low protein diet. I would call it restricted or limited amount. And when we call say it restricted or limited considered to the usual amount, usual am amount or taking, usual intake of the protein of the population is usually more than two grams per day which is more than the requirement of we compare it to the RDA, which is 0.8 to 1 gram per kg. Is that a problem? It's not a problem as long as the kidney is okay and the liver is okay. But now if we have a hemodialysis patient, they go for 1.2, it is limited or restricted if we compare it to the two grams, but it, indeed it is high when we compare it to the RDA, which is 0.8 to 1. So, uh, just to correct what is in the mind, patient in the hemodialysis, who they are in hemodialysis, they are not on low protein or risk amount. They are need indeed higher amount of protein than even the, the general population. I mean, the needs, the RDA, not the intake. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Saleh, we, we got it all about the uh, low carb and the ketogenic. Now we'll go, let's go to the intermittent fasting. Okay, Intermit intermittent fasting is also an interesting topic and has been studied and uh, the, there's a recent study published in New England Journal of Medicine and uh, l l l it has uh, showing the effect in decreasing, l l l again, the surrogate markers, A1C and uh, blood pressure and lipid profile. Uh, and uh, this is the l l l l a recommendation by Sunna. Yeah, and if you, if you are fasting Monday and Thursday, so you are following Sunna, and uh, there's uh, studies showing benefit with this uh, 
type of diet, intermittent fasting. Mr. Zaki, your advice on intermittent fasting. We need more on intermittent fasting. Our audience are desperate to learn about the intermittent fasting. So in addition to what Dr. Salih mentioned, what do you have to add? Okay, um, intermittent fasting, I will just uh, remember, remind you of the I would say yes, it is proven that uh, fasting is uh, working with weight reduction. Yes, it is not, you cannot define how much uh, you would lose of the weight as when you follow a designed diet. You know, could, with design diet, it would be uh, defined how many kilogram per week or per month uh, you are going to lose. In here, it is not defined, but it still it works with what the weight lose. It's, uh, you, it's used as a weight reduction uh, tool. Um, there are different ways of following the fasting uh, or intermittent fasting. Some of the ways is just like uh, to keep fasting uh, from uh, morning until night and then at the night to take like 500 kilocalorie. And then in the other day when you go back, of course, you go back to the normal amount of the food that you are taking. Otherwise, if you feel craving for food and you are taking more because you didn't take more, you didn't take enough last night, then it wouldn't be, uh, it wouldn't, be uh, it wouldn't affect your weight, still your weight will be will remain the same. So uh, it's uh, this is one type. Of course, when you say about intermittent fasting, intermittent fasting is when we talk about it, it's the medical one, which is you can take water. Of course, it's not like what is in the uh, Islam. You know, it's, it's uh, keeping uh, fasting of uh, everything. It's keeping fasting of uh, the food, which is with calories. Otherwise, with water, like for example, is not. So yes, uh, but if we combine it together, I would say yalla. If we combine it together and you fast for one day, when you go for that, just go for a very light breakfast after fasting. And then you then in the other day keep the same amount that you used to take in the other days the same. Don't increase it; otherwise, you will lose what you get in the other, in the previous day. So, if we're gonna go for the medical the term of intermittent fasting, what things the the, the candidate is allowed to take during the, the that medical fasting, like coffee, tea, water, any what's what's the kind allowed? Okay, uh, any non-calories providing food is allowed. It's just water is okay. You can take water. Coffee is okay without sugar, of course. Tea without sugar is okay. Okay, so uh, this is could be uh, the, the main food item that can be taken. Otherwise, the other food, most of the other foods are uh, containing of calories. Uh, the idea is even is to get the body using the stored calories. You know, when you are, the, 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 someone is fasting for this period of time and you are uh, depriving the body from calorie intake for this period, because if you say, you know, if you take the lunch, this is one, by the way, this is one of the ways for fasting, intermittent fasting. If you take the lunch for dinner, like tonight, if you take the dinner tonight, and then you keep fasting up till tomorrow, the mid uh, Maghrib time. So uh, during this time, there is no calorie providing. Body is going to use the fat which is stored in the body for providing the body with the energy. And then in the at night, tomorrow night, when you are take going to take 500 kilocalorie, still your body is depriving because your body needs about in average is about 2,000 kilocalorie. This is still, you need a 1,500 kilocalorie that is not, has been not provided. So these 150 or 1,500 calories is going to be still 
going to be drained or taken from the body stores or which is in here is the fat. But one thing I need, I'd like to address in here that any weight reduction diet should be combined with exercises. Because if without exercises, studies shows that depriving of the body from calories, you cannot control if it is going to be only from the fat. You know, it can be go even from the muscle mass or the protein which is stored in the body. To prevent that from happening, making exercises which is going to use indeed you know, muscles is not going to give the, the amino acid for providing the in, energy to the body as long as they, they need it for exercising because they are using these muscles. So the body is going to be drive to use only the fat. So exercising and diet should go always together for weight reduction diet. This is, this is an Excellent note, uh, Mr. Zeki. Actually, there is lots of a question from our audience about the exercise. And we did not entertain the exercise a question, not because they are not important, because the session tonight is mainly about that. But exercise, as clearly explained, is a critical component of the intervention. And for that reason, we are devoting Omsia Kamala one evening about the exercise and we're going to invite our national subject matter expert to talk about exercise specifically just like what we did tonight with the diet so exercise is critical but we are devoting a whole evening for the uh, for the exercise so thank you for the clarification mr zaki uh, Saleh. intermittent fasting calculating the carbs the ketogenic what about for those who are pregnant what precaution would you exercise when giving nutrition therapy advice for pregnant ladies with either in birth sugar or diabetes? Okay, this is an excellent question about a pregnant with diabetes. Either it's GDM, gestational diabetes, or pre-gestational diabetes. We mean uh, type 1 get pregnant or type 2 already established type 2 and she get pregnant. Or patient develop diabetes during pregnancy, gestational diabetes. We don't recommend keto and we don't recommend prolonged fasting for uh, pregnant uh, ladies with diabetes. Uh, some of the studies, they are pointing to the benefit of going with low glycemic index diet. Low glycemic index diet, uh, it helps uh, for, for pregnant with diabetes because you know pregnancy with diabetes, the most correlated factor with adverse event and with complication is the postprandial hyperglycemia. And we are focusing on one hour postprandial hyperglycemia. To fine tune the postprandial hyperglycemia, uh, some of studies mentioning low glycemic index uh, types of diet, it's beneficial. Again, should be supervised under a registered dietitian because pregnancy depends on the, their calorie intake, their weight uh, increment during pregnancy and the type of diabetes and to calculate how many calories per day they are need. And usually they need extra 300 calories uh, because of pregnancy and uh, to be uh, under supervision of registered dietitian, keto not recommended and fasting is not recommended. Excellent. Uh, Mr. Zeki, uh, two things we... more uh, just to add to the Salah Fee may allow. Um, the diet usually for pregnant ladies is uh, most of them will work with distribution of the meals to uh, three meals, main meals, and then three snacks. Uh, and the other things that for the 300 kilocalorie, of course, just to, uh, to uh, get our audiences uh, aware that it is in the third trimester. So they don't, if the Salah didn't mean that it is from the, the first uh, yes, sure. uh, day of uh, pregnancy. It is only for the third trimester. Otherwise, uh, for patients who, who I would say, sorry, for the pregnant who they are in the first or second trimester, they need the same calories uh, they, uh, 
who they, that they needed before the pregnancy. That's all depends on their weight and their level. Yeah, and usually so you use the pre-pregnancy yes. pre yes. weight. You will use the pre-pregnancy weight, not the, yes. the weight after pregnancy, even the third trimester. Excellent. Mr. Zeki, dietitian, certified dietitian are not that common. And like people, we need a lot of you, but there are not so many available to the patient and to the provider. Now, everything comes with application. Can we use application to help us manage the diet? Would you recommend a few of these applications, smartphone applications? Well, uh, I don't, I haven't used uh, that uh, the application. I just got, got a look at some of applications for sometimes as a kind of uh, of inquisitive uh, issue. Otherwise, I didn't use any one of these. But I would say that uh, for myself, for example, uh, when I because I'm teaching um, uh, courses uh, for uh, my trainees, I am, I created an Excel sheet, an Excel sheet that to be used by our trainees. I will be glad to provide it uh, to you if there's some way. You know, uh, when this Excel sheet, we can use it to calculate the amount of calories, even either for two Excel sheets indeed, one for diabetic and one for diabetic uh, renal patients or kidney patients, um, which is can be used for calculating of the amount of calories that is needed using the weight. You just add, get the weight and the height, uh, the age, the gender of the, pa of the patient, and then it will calculate the amount of calories and then it will distribute it for you for uh, how much of carbohydrates and then how much of uh, protein and fat, which is the macronutrients. And then in the other step, you can just get the portion, number of portion uh, in each food group and it will calculate it automatically. So it's easier, very easy one to be used once you are familiar how to use it and then it will be fine. Uh, and if, it, if you use this one, and at the same time for the slide that I showed for 1500 calories, which is shows the portion size of food item in each food group, you will know how to advise your patient exactly. So you will tailor your patient um, diabetic needs or diet needs um, and make it more, and uh, or let's just say make it individualized. Indeed. Uh, the other one is the same for diabetes, for the diabetic kidney disease. So I would be glad indeed to send it to you if you if they like to use it. Excellent. So actually, I got a question from the audience regarding some of the resources that you mentioned, and I'll be more than happy to share it through the Twitter and the website to all of our audience. And that would be great from you, Mr. Zaki, from you, Dr. Saleh. So I'll, we'll be the more than happy to share the resources with our audience the minute we receive it from you. Excellent. Sure. sure. Uh, Dr. Saleh, we got a few minutes left. Like there is concern about a concept called insulin resistant and diet. What's your intake? Is it, are you going to approach anything different to avoid the risk of insulin resistant or the same dietary advice? Yes, insulin resistance, we mentioned, uh, we highlight uh, about it in the lectures. So uh, the problems, if we're talking specifically about low-carb diet, the problems, uh, they will depend more on fat and protein, saturated fat. This will increase insulin resistance. That's why the, this diet regimen, they lose the, their efficacy after 12 months in the long run. So... Uh, in general, if we are not talking about low carb diet specifically, what increase insulin resistance? Obesity. Uh, if the question about dietary approach to decrease insulin resistance, uh, low fat compared to low carb is more sustainable, more durable. Low carb would give you fast result in the short term, but in the long run, there is a problem with sustainability and durability. Low fat, especially the saturated fat and the trans fat. 
trans fat actually should be minimized and avoided and the saturated fat, this will decrease the insulin uh, resistance, decreasing the obesity will decrease the insulin resistance and the exercise also. Uh, it will decrease the insulin resistance. Excellent, excellent. Mr. Zaki, healthy plate. Can we use it for diabetics? Definitely, yes. Definitely. Would you would you explain it in, in one minute for us? What does that mean, healthy plate? Okay, uh, healthy plate, food plate. It means that you uh, you when you take the plate, which is nine inches size, uh, you know, um, you divide it to four sections. One section equal sections. Four equal sections. One section would be for protein, which is, for example, chicken, meat, fish, and let's just say full adas, طبعا full adas and كطبخة يعني. Coke, uh, broad beans, the origin. Any kind of legumes. The other one, uh, egg, for example, uh, liver, kidney, cheese. This is protein in one quarter. The other quarter is for the grains and bread. For example, if it is for in the breakfast, for bread, samuli, shabura. Uh, for the dinner or lunch, rice, macaron, pasta, jarish, haris. This is will take the other, the second quarter. The other two quarters are divided to vegetables and fruit. So vegetables will take the third quarter and the, cook, the, the fruits will take the fourth quarter. The dairy products will be in addition to this plate. Let's just say a cup of milk or yogurt or leaven, and that will be a complete meal. Of course, taking in consideration that this is will be will, I'm to, in here to, we are talking about the amount. But when we go for the type or the quality of the food, of course, the dairy products should we should go or it's, it's better to go for uh, low fat. So when the, you go for meat, meats should be low in fat or trimmed fat, uh, fat and uh, and removal of the skin of the chicken. Not don't to, not to fry any food. Making a variety of food for the vegetables and fruit make it more colored. So because each color has a different contents of some kind of uh, nutrients or functional foods, which is called functional foods. So. This is the plate in short. Okay, so we are coming to the end. I got the three minutes left. So in one minute, Dr. Saleh, summarize take home messages for the audience from your perspective. Okay, so our talk is, is not replacing individualized approach by the patient uh, primary physicians, general. This is first. Second, uh, uh, the main objectives for this talk for our primary care physicians, uh, nutrition therapy is a powerful weapon in our hand, shouldn't be ignored or underutilized. As addressed by the ADA, it's a viable approach and if your patient not meeting the glycemic targets, you can get backward steps and address their dietary habits and always go individualize. No size fits all. Every patient is different. So the old fashioned pre-printed prescription of 1800 cal calories, uh, 2000 cal calories and 1600 cal calories is not recommended. So we don't get brochures or pre-printed material and we distribute it to the patient and we advise them to follow this strictly in your breakfast, eat this and this and this. In your lunch, eat this and this. Our goal of nutrition therapy to maintain the pleasure of eating. We shouldn't forget this and we should go individualized based on patient characters and always 
nutrition therapy should be supervised by healthcare provider. And we are not calling and advocating for keto diet or very low carb diet. We show the evidence because this is a trend. Many patients I face, they go keto or low carb, low carb by themselves. And uh, this is not recommended. Every patient is different and we should go uh, by sober vision. And uh, carb in uh, intake is not uh, all bad. There is nutritive uh, and vitamins, mineral in fruit and vegetable shouldn't be eliminated totally and go individual uh, and go individual and thank you. Uh, Mr. Zaki, in one minute summary, take home messages from your perspective. Uh, but, uh, I would say, you know, Dr. Saleh make it more, uh, more complicated to our practitioners in the primary health care, we would say to indulge them. <laughs> would indulge them <laughs> if they are going, if they, you know, if they don't have uh, a dietitian certified or registered dietitian with them, which is very difficult indeed, you know, because we know that our, our practitioners there are not... Uh, uh, trained to as you do uh, to uh, to do all of these uh, tasks indeed uh, but anyhow uh, it's just like a start but I would say that the diet for the kidney uh, is important because it's going to uh, the patient has a CKD because a diet is going to control uh, this CKD or to, uh, deterioration or even to prevent this deterioration uh, of the kidney disease. And uh, one of the main aspects for that is uh, controlling of blood sugar since beginning and blood pressure and to have a good, uh, uh, to maintain a healthy body weight. Um, this is a, a very important task. I know it is, it is a little bit uh, uh, hectic for the primary health care who they are there. But I remember when I was in uh, national uh, اللي هي اللجنه الوطنيه لمكافحه السكري تبع uh, المجلس الصحي uh, one of the things that when even when we wrote the guidelines diabetic guidelines for primary health care in 2014 uh, we mentioned that there you know that primary health care physician and practitioners so they are practicing in the primary health care needs indeed to have uh, a good training on the diet because of the lack of the presence of the uh, dietitians in the primary health care. I would say you are doing a, a very great job in the primary health care because uh, you are taking care of all of the issues indeed, uh, uh, medically and nutritionally, uh, I would say, uh, you know, well done. Uh, and you are on the front line as uh, Dr. Hadi uh, says, uh, or of my um, uh, wishes to you. Okay. So thank you very, very much, my great speakers, Dr. Saleh and Mr. Zaki, very valuable lecture. I personally learned a lot tonight. Thank you very much. For my great audience, there are a few announcements. I got lots of questions about the CME. Yes, there is two CME hours. And if uh, the registration will be done to you, give us two weeks to get your CME through the uh, Saudi Commission. If you have a question about your CME, our great company, even to Troop, is there to help. For other courses, that there are many of them that they are coming. Uh, please follow us on uh, FM Hub Twitter. We're going to announce about all the coming courses, and we're going to share all the relevant materials from our great speakers. Few a few courses to mention, the procedure course coming soon. Crash Sui, if you are one of these docetic for the final exam, November 16, 18, we have an international diabetic foot. We have radiology for a primary care on November 21 to 22. We have communication skills. Don't miss that. That's very special. On December 8, and many, many other to come. Committed with, going to come on November 25 with the great talent of family physician answering family medicine. Why? And on December 2nd, we're going to have another interesting evening on the flu vaccine, myths and facts. By this, I come to the end of the evening. Thank you very much again, my great speaker and audience. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Fi